Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Marion Fourcade, and I, I am the director of uh, UC Berkeley Social Science Matrix. So you all know Matrix as uh, the place where interdisciplinary is not, interdisciplinarity is not merely evoked, but where actually it actually happens. But it is a particularly felicitous moment when we can bring together not only people from across the disciplines, but also from the wider world of practice. So we are delighted to welcome today one economic historian, one economics and finance professor, one financier and theorist of finance, and one legal scholar and political scientist to discuss how financial impunity arose during the long 18th century in Europe. In the brilliant book that will be discussed today, Trevor Jackson combines aspects of regulatory history and financial history to narrate how during this period of political anger and economic upheaval, financial crisis went from being understood as crimes to become naturalized as disasters. And then we will have, of course, a conversation between the present and, and the past with these wonderful panelists. Today's event is part of our Author Meets Critics series. We would like to thank our co-sponsors for these events and the Berkeley Economy and Society Initiative and the UC Berkeley Department of History. As always, I will mention uh, our last upcoming events of the semester on Friday. Elizabeth Joe will close our programming for the semester with a talk on the use of algorithm algorithms by police. And then you can already look forward to our next semester. Um, Julia, who's right here in the front and who I must thank for putting together our, our entire events program this semester. She's also been hard at work and we have a lot of fantastic panels to look forward to in the spring. So I apologize, my voice is a little broken. We will return on January 19, appropriately actually, with a discussion of, of a very Berkeley topic, the unnaming of Crover Hall and the title of course, of a recent book by linguistics professor Andrew Garrett. So now I will introduce our moderator, David. Um, David Singh Grewal is professor of law um, at UC Berkeley School of Law. His teaching and research interests include legal and political theory, intellectual history, particularly the history of economic thought, global economic governance and international trade law, intellectual property law and biotechnology, and law and economics. His first book, um, Network Power, The Social Dynamics of Globalization, was published by Yale University Press in 2008. And his second book, The Invention of the Economy, is forthcoming from Harvard. Perpetually forthcoming. Well, <laughs> we'll say forthcoming from Harvard University Press. So without further ado, I will now turn it over to David. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Marion. Um, let's see, is that is that now? There we go. Okay. Um, so I think it's recording. Anyhow, uh, thank you all for being here. It's, I'm delighted to be able to moderate this session. Um, to my immediate left is Trevor Jackson. He's an economic historian who teaches here at Cal as of this year in both the history and the political economy departments. Uh, and we're really delighted to have him. Um, he, he researches inequality and crisis, mostly but not exclusively in early modern Europe. I think he's developing a side business in modern crisis, uh, and we'll hear, maybe hear about that in the Q&A. Uh, his first book, which is here available at a fine bookseller near you, um, is uh, Impunity and Capitalism, the Afterlives of European Financial Crises, 1690 to 1830. It was published by Cambridge University Press last fall. His current research interests focus on the problem of gluts, overproduction and overaccumulation since the 17th century, the problems of temporality and finitude in economic thought, and problems in the historical measurement and meaning of capital. Those of you who have had a chance to read this great book will see a lot of those themes resonate with the history he tells. He also has ongoing research interests in the histories of extinction and catastrophe, as well as early modern occupational health. That may be why a gilded, um, what do they call it? Uh, a gilded guillotine is on the front cover for those interested in occupational health. Uh, and to this wonderful list of interests, I hope that um, 
he, I, th I think he should add law because there's a lot of legal thought, legal history in the book. And one of the things that interests me in the book is the way in which uh, it really is at once a legal history as well as a financial history. So I'm, I'm delighted to, to be able to moderate. And the two commentators today are uh, to Trevor's immediate left, uh, uh, Bill William Janeway, uh, who is an affiliated member of the economics faculty at Cambridge University. And he's the author of Doing Capitalism in the Innovation Economy. He's a special limited partner of Warburg and Pincus, having joined the firm in 1988 and served as head of its information technology investment practice for 15 years. He's chair of the board of directors of the Social Science Research Council and the founder of the Cambridge Endowment for Research and the Janeway Institute for Economics at Cambridge University. Uh, he was co-founder of the Institute for New Economics Thinking, which many of us know and some of us have been privileged to work with. Um, and he received his doctorate in economics from Cambridge University, where he was a Marshall Scholar. Uh, and to his immediate left is, is Anat Admati, the George G.C. Parker Professor of Finance and Economics at, at Stanford University uh, Graduate School of Business. She's the faculty director of the Corporations and Society Initiative and a senior fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, writing and teaching on the interactions of business, law, and policy. Admati is the co-author with Martin Helwig of The Banker's New Clothes. Wrong with banking, what to do about it? Yes, cover please, there we are. And no one got fat. <laughs> yes, uh, and what to do about it. Uh, and the new and expanded edition is forthcoming in January 2024. Just got the copy last night. Oh, okay. very good. So I'm afraid that's what forthcoming actually means. So I probably but should digital, stop. It's putting... available already. It's yeah. available in e It's available at fine booksellers near you. Um, <laughs> Not yet. Yeah, or, or soon to be. Online. Online. <laughs> in 2014, she was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People and one of the Foreign Policy Magazine's 100 Global Thinkers. She holds uh, degrees from Hebrew U, uh, many degrees from Yale University, and an honorary doctorate from Zurich. And so we're delighted to have both commentators and Trevor. Without further ado, I think, Trevor, would, would you lead us through the book a bit? All right, great. Am I audible? Great. Um, well, thank you, David, for that introduction. And thank you, Marianne, for inviting me and for organizing all of this, and to Julia as well. Uh, and thank you all for coming out on uh, at the end of the term, reading week, I observe more than one person who I know is on leave and is nonetheless here. And so thank you for that. Um, so I thought what I would do is spend a few minutes uh, talking through the narrative of the book. Uh, my publishers tell me scandalously that there are at least three to five people in the world who have not read it. Um, you know who you are. Uh, so I thought I would give you a sense of the narrative um, and maybe belabor the historian points that might not otherwise be evident. Um, and then try to give you a sense of what I thought I was trying to do, um, and maybe a few things, since this is an author meets critics uh, panel, a few things that I think I didn't successfully do um, and meant to do. And so I think that's the plan. Um, so the book is about impunity. Um, and I came to impunity in part because of an archival disaster which is to say that I went off looking for something that I thought I would find and didn't find it. And I had a kind of long, dark night of the soul in Strasbourg uh, in 2014 and asked myself what I had found, what the sources were telling me. Um, and what they were telling me was a sort of wonderful record of frauds, scams, scandals, mendacity, lies, crimes, um, and other assorted malfeasance. And I thought, well, I, perhaps there's something here that I can historicize. Um, and so just to kind of lay the groundwork, I came at this as an economic historian. Uh, not many people are economic historians anymore, and especially so in history departments. According to the American Historical Association, fewer than 5% of historians call themselves economic historians. Uh, I was trained by one of the last great economic historians, Jan de Vries, of uh, 50 years at Berkeley. And I was preoccupied by trying to think of how the future of my discipline might look. How might I bring together history and economics in a new way? How might I make it interesting and intelligible to history departments? Um, and in that dark night of the soul in 2014, I thought to myself, you know, what are the big questions that the field is pursuing? And of course, 2014 was the year of Thomas Piketty, uh, and everyone was talking about inequality. And I thought to myself, well, maybe there's a way that I can try to tell a story about inequality 
that makes it interesting and intelligible to historians. Uh, because I had already found that when I talked to my historian colleagues about inequality very frequently, uh, I would the answer that I would get is, do you just mean economic inequality? And I would usually say, what, what do you mean just? Uh, but you know, is there a way that I can push the concept further um, while still hopefully trying to keep it analytically tractable? Um, with ultimately the pitch, uh, perhaps unsuccessful, uh, that inequality might be a way of bringing history and economics back together. That if we think about it, maybe inequality is the only thing that all historians work on to some degree or another, given that we're all concerned with questions of power um, and different forms of injustice and inequality over time. So with that in mind, I tried to conceptualize something that I thought would be tractable and applicable to the documents that I had found. And so what I did is try to move a lot of the conceptual framework of impunity as it currently exists in the world of international law, mostly coming at, since the 2002 founding of the International Criminal Court, which has as its stated purpose, ending impunity. And so they have a legal idea of what impunity means and seeing if I could adapt that to the history of financial crisis, because I felt like there were similar problems at work. When the ICC tries to prosecute world leaders for mass crimes, they tend to run into a few specific problems. There's a problem of scale insofar as many legal systems are better equipped to handle individual crimes, say murder rather than large scale crimes. There's a problem of precedent in that uh, malfeasance tends to exceed existing laws and regulations. And there's a problem of culpability in that uh, world leaders tend not themselves to be personally guilty of any sort of crime. And I thought, well, maybe these problems and other attendant problems uh, seem to me kind of similar to the problems that I thought I was seeing, uh, specifically as I was researching the 1720 financial crisis. And so I thought, can I take these ideas, can I apply them to financial crises of the past, and in doing so, generate some new way of thinking about economics and inequality? That was the plan. So the book begins... Uh, really with two related cases in the early 18th century. The first is the bankruptcy of someone called Samuel Bernard, who was the richest man in Europe. He was the personal banker to Louis XIV. And in 1709, for a series of kind of hilarious hijinks that get terribly out of hand, he goes bankrupt. And in doing so, he undercuts the basis of something called the Lyon Fair, which was the kind of quarterly clearing mechanism for much of the finance and commerce in southeastern France through the Rhine corridor and into Switzerland. People in an age before, well, bank accounts and you know, a lot of available specie would keep running tabs with each other over long periods of time. And they would meet ostensibly quarterly to clear these tabs. And some relatively small amount of specie would change hands in theory. Very often they would just roll over the outstanding debt and proceed again. But they needed some you know, circulating liquidity to make this transaction work, and Samuel Bernard provided that. And so when he went bankrupt, the Lyon Fair collapsed. Credit dried up throughout this entire kind of arc of Western Europe. This coincided with the coldest winter in half a millennium, uh, in which suddenly the Lyon government found itself needing to provide more support to more hungry people exactly when it didn't have the tax revenue from the fair. And so there's a kind of social disaster. Samuel Bernard gets a pardon, and in fact, his creditors get prosecuted, which was the opposite of the normal procedure in which you know, debtors would be prosecuted and set to debtor's prison. Uh, he's the personal banker of the king. He is too big to fail. He has connections to the judicial system. He gets special treatment. In 1716, following the War of the Spanish Succession, the French government is saddled with a huge amount of outstanding debt. And they have recourse to something called the Chambre de Justice, the Chamber of Justice, which was a common legal procedure in old regime France, in which the entirety of the French financial community, uh, in the case of 1716, 4,399 people, would collectively be prosecuted in the belief that they must have done something wrong. Uh, and this being old regime France, there's no presumption of innocence, there's no right to counsel. Most people would flee, they would pay bribes to not be prosecuted. We generally interpret this as a kind of structured default. Instead of just not repaying the debt, what you do is force the people that you owe to pay you in fines, which makes it easier to repay the debt. Uh, and so this is a moment where the fiscal crisis, the French monarchy, 
is, at least within the legal system of the French monarchy, worked out as though the creditors are all criminals and are prosecuted for that uh, crime. And so that seems a far you know, distant world from the one that we live in today. And so that's where it begins, in this moment in which uh, financial crises are interpreted through a legal order and the sovereign has the scope to decide who gets prosecuted and who doesn't. The book ends with the Panic of 1825, uh, which again, through a kind of hilarious series of circumstances, is the first uh, perhaps endogenously produced financial crisis uh, in the history of the Western financial system, meaning that it isn't necessarily the result of wars, of uh, famines, of some sort of exogenous surprise. It's generated by the financial system itself. In the working out of the Panic of 1825, uh, not only is nobody prosecuted, but it never even crosses anybody's mind. It isn't even a thinkable, intelligible, meaningful possibility. And so the book tries to explain how we go from the world of Samuel Bernard and the Champs de Justice to the Panic of 1825. Or in the kind of tagline of the book, how do we move from a world in which financial crises are understood to be crimes to a world in which they're understood to be kind of natural disasters? That's the, the large arc of the story. So what I thought this was going to do, or what I intended it to do, uh, was a few different things. So one I've already alluded to, which was to try to produce new ways of thinking about inequality uh, that might speak to inequality scholars on the economist side of economic history, but also might provide a kind of intelligible point of entry to my historian colleagues. Beyond that, I was trying to historicize what I viewed as a, a pretty commonly held narrative, which is about the emergence of the economy as a separate sphere of social life and especially of governance. I mean, this is almost a classic Carl Polanyi story. I know there are many sociologists in the room um, that there was some time before in which economies and economic lives are embedded in social life and political life and something happens to remove the economy. And I thought maybe this is a way of tracing that emergence of finance specifically so that that could confine the scope of what I'm looking at as a separate sphere with its own institutions of governance, its own regulations, its own special norms. And that even in the case of 18th century European finance, its emergence as at first a separate place because financial markets were physical locations, Exchange Alley in London, uh, the Rue Quincampoix in Paris, where people would go to physically exchange uh, securities. and. In the literature of the moment, these were conceived as specific places with their own specific rules and specific people with strange languages and same strange procedures. Nearly every financial crisis that I read about tended to also involve some sort of moral panic uh, about, in the early stages, people across religions doing business with each other, that finance is this place with no rules, where Christians and Muslims and Jews might do business with each other. Uh, it was a place because it was unregulated, from which women were not yet excluded. And so there was a whole moral panic in the pamphlet literature in English uh, about women getting access to money that other people couldn't control. And so I found like this felt like not just the emergence conceptually of a separate sphere, but almost socially, uh, politically, that there was something to trace, not just a teleological emergence, but a kind of contested one in which there's a kind of uh, possibility of emergence that meets in crisis is then regulated and kind of tamped down on until it emerges again. Which gets to the second thing that I was trying to do, uh, which is that after seven years of arguing with my fellow grad students about causality and uh, what is history and what are agents, um, what I ultimately settled on was a kind of narrative implotment that I meant to be genuinely dialectical in the sense of a set of conflicts producing a crisis that has some sort of resolution. The resolution in turn sets up and produces the conditions for the next crisis. Um, and I think we kind of are already willing to think that insofar as we're very willing to think that regulation is always regulating the previous crisis. Right? 
And a new crisis tends to be understood given the distorted historical memory of the previous one. And so I wanted to take that seriously, even at a material level, sort of what kinds of financial activities were possible given a past set of regulations and what kinds of ways around them generated new forms of instability. Which gets to the last thing that I was trying to do, which is that although it's a book about financial crises and although I would try to claim to be an economic historian and although it's got capitalism in the title, sort of fundamentally, the big game that I was hunting was actually about crises of political legitimacy. Because I felt like what I saw again and again in moments of crises following which the public perceives some set of injustice that hasn't been dealt with, I felt like I perceived potentially an escalation to a crisis of political legitimacy. Um, you see this a bit in the aftermath of the 1720 crisis, much more profoundly in the 1780s and 1790s. Um, sometimes it's there, sometimes it isn't. Again, this isn't a sort of teleological move towards more or less, but rather different moments in which there are different possibilities of legitimacy crises. And that especially by the end, after 1825, the idea that the inequalities of the emerging capitalist economic order, or say the costs and consequences of financial crises were unevenly distributed, that although this no longer had a legal implication, um, I think at the popular level, that the sense that there is an injustice to that world of 19th century capitalist economic life was one of the motivating factors behind most of the like large scale ideologies of the 19th century. That most 19th century political ideologies in some way are addressed to the question of like whose fault are the economic injustices around us? And perhaps, you know, for the nationalists, it's the foreigners and for the anti-Semites, it's the Jews and for the socialists, it's the capitalists. But in general, that most ideologies of the 19th century were trying to deal with this question uh, that was never quite resolved and that they never quite had the language to deal with. So those are the things that I was trying to do. There are a couple of things that I think I failed at. <laughs> I'm going to preempt my critics. Um, we'll, we'll see. Uh, so. The first is an empirical strategy, uh, which is to say I needed to choose my cases. And a thing about studying uh, exceptions, mistakes, crimes, violations of laws and orders and so on, is that uh, people who break laws and get caught leave archival traces. People who break laws and don't get caught don't. People who don't break laws at all might not leave archival traces. And so it's very difficult to assess the denominator uh, and the like changing prevalence over time. That, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm in the social science matrix to use the social science term. What I did is I selected on the dependent variable um, and chose cases, both because there was an archival density and so the sources were talking to me, but cases that left enough of a paper trail of malfeasance that there was a story to be told there. Um, in my mind, this the harsher version of this is that I made up a concept and went around early modern Europe saying, oh, there it is. Oh, but it's not that, uh, you know. I think there is a truth to that. The more that I read about the construction of economic concepts, the better I feel, because to some extent, I think we've maybe all done that. But what I didn't do is produce some sort of falsifiable, tangible, measurable, empirical thing that I could say you know, this is 10 impunity as opposed to five, right? Um, some way of tracing it across time. Now, often when I talk to my historian colleagues and I say this, they say, well, look, that's just kind of what history is like. We can't know the total set of the past. We know the imperfect record that remains to us. And it's very difficult to assess the total set of things that we can't know. Um, and I think that there is a truth to that. At the same time, though, I think that uh, in an absence of some sort of falsifiable set of claims and a set of cases that may be selected on a kind of well selection bias standpoint, then may themselves be epiphenomenal. I'm actually not persuaded 
that the meta level story holds up as strong as each individual case. In the end, what I kind of hoped to do was to be uh, either generative or perhaps provocative enough that there might be further studies on differing forms of impunity. I observe that there are many historians, including my excellent colleague Puck Engman, who I don't think is here, but uh, nonetheless is working on transitional justice. Lots of historians are working on transitional justice in different moments and different contexts. And it's a concept that's providing a way for us to talk to each other across fields. And I thought maybe impunity is a way to do that. Maybe that's a way that I thought I could bring historians and economists together to talk about inequality. But maybe, in fact, it's a way of talking to sociologists, political scientists. And I've been very pleasantly surprised to find professors at law schools turn out to be terrific interlocutors to think about impunity and are very interested in this sort of subject. And so it may have ended up doing something different from what I intended. Um, but that's what I thought I was doing. And I think maybe what I ended up doing and not doing instead. And so I'll stop there before I carry on. Thanks. It may turn out that some of what I have to say may ease your concern, Trevor, about what you failed to do in part. Um, but first, I just want to begin by saying that this book deeply enriches a domain of scholarship research experience that has historically been underserved. And that is the frontier where the dynamics of the political process meet the dynamics of the market, and particularly the dynamics of the financial markets. Um, and this notion of the establishment of the market economy and particularly the financial markets as an autonomous domain, a regime that has its own rules and laws and which is exempt from the broader moral economy. It's a very powerful concept. And of course, there's a resonance from 1825 to 2008, nine, when nobody went to jail except one junior banker who actually was a foreigner. Um, now, one question that that offers, and I'm going to come back to this, and this is where I think I, I would kind of give you at least a partial pardon. Um, the book but certainly it pushed me to think hard about what are the conditions under which the moral world reaches out and embraces the financial system and imposes punishment. Because we do have examples that come after 1825. In fact, in some cases, very much. But I'm going to come back to that. First, I do want to point out one of the other more specific residences that I found very powerful is the manner in which John Law's system in France, creating an enormous sea of liquidity in the context of a dysfunctional fiscal system, seems an awful lot like what happened in this country and in the Western world, but particularly in the United States, in the aftermath, in the context of the Great Recession, with austerity descending from what we thought, or perhaps I should say, ascending from a corpse which we thought had moldered away to assert itself across the Western world, in fact, across everywhere but China, um, between 2010 uh, and then, uh, under the impact of COVID, the, quote, unconventional monetary policy serving as the functional equivalent of John Law's system in motivating an enormous flood of liquidity into financial markets, into the financial system, which in turn engenders the unicorn bubble, the excesses and extensions of which fully meet the requirements of uh, being resonant with the South Sea bubble. Um, so that I thought was a really, really useful um, connection. Um, one aspect of this 
And I think the discussion in the book of the currency bullion controversy in Britain approaching 1825, establishing an intellectual frame in which you have the basis for laissez-faire uh, at a pretty deep level. David Ricardo is a really, really strong thinker and political presence. Not unlike the world that your colleague Brad DeLong knows better than anybody else in this room, a world in which efficient markets, rational expectations, the notion that markets are self-correcting mechanisms that can be relied upon uh, creates an environment in which we can have the global financial crisis and then constrain the response to the global financial crisis. Um, now, I do want to point out, and for those who are interested in modern, the modern uh, echoes uh, that this book generates, um, some things worth taking a look at. Um, what happened to the Bering family in 1890, the first Bering's crisis? They didn't go to jail, but Bering's was, had been, as demonstrated in the book, in the years up to 1825, the, the historian of the, of the Bering's Bank referred to it as, the title of the book is The Sixth Great Power of Europe. Um, the Bering's partners, most of whom were members of the House of Lords when that was not um, a, a, a kind of way of, of, as Boris Johnson said, embarrassing people who used to walk, people who were in the House of Lords by nominating your 28-year-old personal assistant to be, to be a peer. Um, the Barings were wiped out. They were liquidated in 1890. Um, so something was going on there. And I do think there's a linkage for those who really want to read deeply into this history. There's a linkage from this book to David Kinnerston's great three-volume history of the city of London, which is replete with scoundrels, some of whom enjoy impunity and some of whom wind up in the slammer, uh, having been engaged in financial manipulations and frauds of, of one kind or another. But then... Um, Coming a little more closer to our time, not quite my generation, 1932-33, the Pecora hearings are an extraordinary moment in the financial history of the United States. After the Great Crash, after the bank uh, crisis, the Senate Banking Committee, when Hoover is still president with the Republican chair, organizes an investigation of Wall Street. It goes nowhere. There's no energy in it until Roosevelt becomes president, induces the now Democratic chair of the banking committee to reactivate the hearings. An extraordinary lawyer called Ferdinand Pecora, hammer and fist, hammer and tongs, goes after Wall Street. Uh, Sam Insull, the great entrepreneur of, of the utility system in Chicago, flees the country ahead of the indictment. Uh, indictment. Uh, the chairman of the National City Bank, largest bank in the United States, goes to jail for tax evasion. Richard Whitney, the president of the New York Stock Exchange, goes to jail for stealing his client's money. There is no impunity at that moment. But then, you know, even closer to home, and this I remember vividly, in fact, I knew some of the players in this game, in um, 1990, there was a savings and loan crisis. It was nothing like the scale of the global financial crisis. But under that radical, woke president, George H.W. Bush, 200 bankers, including Mike Milken, went to jail. They did jail time uh, for that circle, that, that crisis within a segment of the American financial system. In 2000, the... Um, leading, well, the chairman of WorldCom and the then not quite chief executive, but he became chief executive of Enron, were each sentenced to 25 years in jail for their frauds in the context that were revealed in the context of the breaking of the tech bubble. Um, and then, of course, most recently, uh, Sam Bankman fried and FTX. I don't know. We don't know how long he's going to jail, but I think we are highly confident he's going to jail. Not with he has not uh, enjoyed impunity. So a question is: 
in this context, it's global. Is is two thousand and eight the anomaly, or was it really the reassertion of a central theme of the book? I think the fact that the book asks makes one ask those questions is 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 part of its of its value. So let me just um, close my two brief remarks. <laughs> um, the oh, I should add, by the way, the other thing that's going on right now is the question of the immunity of the Sackler family, the impunity of the Sackler family. Uh, that was going to start with. Yeah. Well, there you go. I turn it over to it. And not a, um, uh, but the um, rolling back, one of the themes that emerges in the latter part of the book is how um, London's rise to dominance as the financial capital is enabled uh, by the House of Barings and the House of Rothschild being the financiers of sovereigns, including the British sovereign, but by no means only the British sovereign. So I think of um, and, and how they finance, particularly the British government in the context of the Napoleonic Wars. And I think of New York, Wall Street, the House of Morgan, rising to a dominant position in financing the British government in World War I and emerging with the US and New York emerging as the financial hegemon uh, of, the, of the last hundred years. And um, with that, I will end except to note that this is a plum pudding of a book. You find extraordinary gems. And the ones that I wrote down, the one I wrote down here, Financial crises and financial speculation often come with innovations. And Minister Necker securitized annuities on seven-year-old Genevoise smallpox survivors on the grounds that they were going to be the most long-lived. And so selling the annuities was going to maximize the return today for a state that was functionally approaching bankruptcy. That's a great gem to discover with that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Marion and Julia for inviting me. Uh, when I saw the title of this book, I immediately wanted to do this uh, because I've been writing exactly on this, except a little bit differently. So, um, you know, in particular, and I brought a few things here in the new edition of this book, the last chapter is called Above the Law question mark. And it's very much about impunity, the word appears. Um, and also, so the idea of um, the narrative of financial crisis as natural disasters, of course, you know, goes back to all these narratives coming from, you know, bankers and regulators and and others saying, oh, it was a hundred year flood. It was like an earthquake, you know, nobody could have seen this coming and all of that, which was completely against uh um, other narratives saying, you know, there were a lot of people at fault uh, and then kind of nobody was home to actually prosecute or any of that. So that that was that. But it wasn't unusual. But really what's missing for me, I come from the world of corporate finance into banking and back into corporate finance and then corporate law and law more generally. So my writing most recently is really about corporations and the rule of law. And one of the words that I really, really, really missed in the index, uh, you know, there is the word contract law, but the word corporation does not exist. Uh, however, you know, the whole issue happening right now with the Purdue Pharma is precisely about corporations. It's about how the corporation, a legal person with rights, a lot of rights, and with a veil that separates the corporations from all people uh, is filing for bankruptcy. And the people who benefited from that corporation, who owned the equity of that corporation, who had a lot of control in it, it's a private corporation, doesn't have shareholders you know, in the public, uh, are not bankrupt and yet want to get impunity out of the bankruptcy of the corporation. Now that's just one of numerous examples where corporations commit crimes, even though they're abstract people. I mean, pg and &E, right in this area, uh, pleaded guilty to 84 manslaughter charges. And the headline in Forbes magazine was, you know, pg and &E 
avoids 90 years in jail for not being a person because a person would get about a year per manslaughter. This was 84 manslaughters and nothing happened. I mean, the fine was ridiculous, like a decimal point uh, for PG&E. And that was a maximum fine. Now they don't go after PG&E criminally, but they go civilly because they can get more money out of PG&E for that. But this is basically the way the way it works. So the corporate form is really the way impunity works in capitalism. And by the time this book starts, we already have the Dutch East India. We already have the key corporations that have become the dominant sort of almost sovereigns in our economy and the ones that give people the impunity that once was given to kings. Uh, in other words, Jamie Dimon has impunity and he will pay a lot of money to hide the and you know pay off the wrongdoings of JP Morgan Chase. Uh, and so will Mark Zuckerberg, if anything uh, is wrong with what Facebook uh, Meta is doing, et cetera, et cetera. So the core reform is really key to this. Now, the book focuses on central banks. And in fact, in the new edition of the book, we go much more to central banks. The original book was The Banker's New Clothes was about private sector banks. And we still talk about private sector banks. The central banks are the enablers of a really bad financial system, including bad uh, system by by lender of last resorts and bailouts, uh, as we speak right now, of potentially insolvent regional banks that uh, were just um, offered uh, excessive uh, loans from the Federal Reserve with backing by Treasury. So you can see a bailout here, slightly obscured from public uh, eyes, so they don't have to use that dreaded word bailout, because after all, uh, Obama promised us no more bailouts, period, and got like two minutes of ovation when he signed the Dodd-Frank Act. So we have impunity galore. Uh, I was asked a couple of years ago with a bunch of other economists what uh, has gone wrong with capitalism and um, what to do about it by Oxford uh, publication. Um, and my essay for that volume uh, was called... Uh, Capitalism laws, to David's point, uh, and the need for trustworthy institutions in both sectors. We need we have lost trust in our institutions, and it's partly because of the way these institutions basically um, create symbiosis that are harming society uh, and create impunity for everybody involved in the private sector and in government. So uh, when asked what's gone wrong with capitalism, my answer was it's destroyed, undermined, overwhelmed, corrupted democracies. And so our democracies are partly in trouble and in crisis, in an intertwined crisis with the whatever people might view as a crisis of capitalism. And in that essay, I when people talk about you know, shareholder capitalism, et cetera, I called it something similar to what you're talking about, I called it financialized capitalism. So financialization has to do with the, the way uh, corporate governance works, the maximization of stock price, return on equity, all these uh, accounting metrics, financialized metrics uh, as an objective and as a way that corporate leaders are uh, what they're chasing. And uh, the inability of democratic governments to actually set the rules of the game for these legal persons and to enforce on these legal persons, a set of rules. The legal system has not envisioned corporations. The constitution has not envisioned corporations, but corporations go to court. And in a, in a book on this called We the Corporations, Adam Winkler from UCLA discusses the civil rights movements of corporations all happening in the courts and receiving more and more rights, including speech rights, religious rights that were intended for human beings. And then using the 14th Amendment and others to require acquire more and more rights. But when it comes to piercing the corporate veil for accountability, we are nowhere uh, good. And Sam beckman fried is the exception and proves the rule. Uh, there are extreme cases where a person like him or like Elizabeth Holmes produce a lot of evidence, especially about defrauding investors. In this case, there were customers as well. But in the case of... Uh, uh, in cases of, of other wrongdoings, a lot of times the um, impact people are employees or customers, um, but shareholders are uh, run 
supreme, even in the legal system, when they can claim to be harmed, they can go to court with class action suits and anywhere else. When their lawyers think that the stock price went down, they will sue. But meanwhile, you know, many customers and employees, except for some new law on sexual harassment, are relegated to mandatory arbitration, don't even have access to the law, even when they're harmed. So in the private law, as well as in the public law, we really have uh, lost the battle um, on uh, on corporate immunity, impunity, corporate and le- corporate leaders impunity when they're able to do it through the corporation, as opposed to be the ones at the top uh, actually uttering the fraud, uh, I- as in the case of of uh, Elizabeth Holmes of Sam Bankman Free. Those are extreme cases, uh, but in other cases, the the, the culpability and the the diffuse responsibility are, are making it so, the, and the ability to create legal shields is making impunity a pervasive problem in the economy and certainly in banking and beyond. One other final comment. Uh, um, the book is very much about financial crisis, but this problem is not one of crisis. Crises are where we see something wrong, but it can be wrong all the time and hidden from view. So I view the entire system as highly distorted and unhealthy, uh, starting with the financial, with the private sector uh Corporation and continuing to some other corporations in other sectors, depending uh, on 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 what they need for good rules of the game and where uh, the rules might be more or less uh, ineffective, uh, depending on the on the sector and and the and the situation. You know, you have wage theft, you have all kind of pollution, you have all kinds of uh, agencies and laws that uh, corporations have to uh, comply with, and oftentimes either they just don't or don't get caught breaking them, or the fines that they pay are uh, not not even commensurate with the harm, uh, let alone do anything to the individuals um, involved because it's too hard, because it's too costly. And there are a bunch of books on this right now, Chicken Shit Club, why, uh, um, how the innocent plead guilty and the guilty go free, too big to jail, multiple books about that without those kinds of titles. And we can go on into how the mechanics of corporate settlements is. And we go through a lot of these examples uh, in the new edition of the book, for which I have the preface and table of contents here and not for everybody in this room. So pick up one. Give you about 10 minutes to respond to these. Comments and then we'll sort of open up and have a discussion. Great. 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 Well, thank you both for that. That was, uh, it's very stimulating to be read at all, let alone read and responded to. Uh, and, uh, especially from people outside of my field and discipline, this has been a very useful and generative uh, set of comments. So, where to begin? Um, so, on the question of, uh, well, really, our contemporary moment in the post 2008 order. I feel like there were several questions that I might kind of cluster together mm-hmm. as being about um, the world since 2008. And I think um, it was a deliberate choice to have the book end in 1825 because I felt like that was the first moment in which I thought I perceived something new, which was to say large scale, what for lack of a better set of words, I would call economic harms that are not broadly popularly interpreted as someone's fault, which there is no agential figure, there's no crime, there's no law being broken, right? It's like a storm. Um, Although, of course, as we historians are increasingly aware of, natural disasters themselves are not necessarily natural disasters, but nonetheless. Um, And that, I felt like, was new. And so what I was trying to get at wasn't necessarily that nobody ever gets prosecuted for any kind of economic crime again. Clearly not. Um, Rather, what I found interesting and wanted to trace the origins of was how we get to a world uh, in which poverty, uh, inequality, stagnant wages, unemployment are not perceived, well, perhaps are perceived as moral problems and certainly policy problems, but aren't perceived as some agential figure's fault outside of claims of political legitimacy, in a sense that I think that could have gone differently had the late 18th and early 19th century financial crises gone differently. And I think that a person from, say, 1709, 
would interpret uh, economic policy today in a very different way than what we do. And so that was the particular thing that I was trying to get at. Um, and so, you know, to make give you a little more tangible example uh, of the distinction that I want to draw here, although I have found myself writing pretty frequently about cryptocurrency and Sam Bacon free and so on, um, I do that because I think it's funny when bad things happen to billionaires. Um, not because I think they fit my cases particularly well. You know, what Sam Bankman-Fried was doing was just fraud. It's garden variety fraud. Uh, now, okay, there's some problems with whether crypto is a security or not. There's some problems with where, you know, if you incorporate in the Bahamas or whatever. But it's clearly just fraud. Uh, he broke some laws. He got caught breaking the laws. He writes in his documents, hello, fellow criminals, let us do crimes. Um, like it's, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. The things that I found striking and wanted to try to historicize is something more like climate change. You know, that emitting carbon into the atmosphere may well kill all of us, but it's not a crime. Right? It's not an intelligible, agential harm. Um, and in fact, many Corporate officers, you might say, have a fiduciary responsibility to do that because it's the basis of their right of their uh, uh, profits and their responsibility to their shareholders. And so that was the thing that I found particularly strange um, that this is something that is likely to be, you know, economists are willing to think of as a market failure. But I thought, can I push that further and historicize how some harm of that scale can take place, be clearly made by people? and yet still exist outside of the same sort of political, moral, normal, legal orders as, say, Sam Bankman-Fried. Um, on the question of corporations, you're exactly right. That's a shortcoming of ending where I do. That, in the cases that I'm looking at, is largely because the creation of limited liability happens after 1825. Right. And so, like, I mean, in the, in the case of 1825, at least in English banking, there is unlimited liability. Like, right. The partners are bailed in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, like, um, yeah, exactly. And so the emergence, a thing that I wish I had done better, and if I had known that I'd be read more by legal scholars, I would have, like, there's a case to be made that a thread that should run through this entire thing is a history of the emergence of liability and how that changes over time. Um, that's something I came to relatively late, and I just don't have the legal training to really, you know, Parse, do you want to get in on? I just wanted to, yeah. Have, and I mentioned the Dutch East India Company. Yeah. Um, there were corporations, but they were they were established by government. They had limited powers. They had, but <clears throat> there was a case that kind of fits right in the middle of your period. Mm -hmm. Would have been really interested what you made of the Warren Hastings mm -hmm. uh, impeachment. Mm -hmm. The uh, head of the East India Company in India who was summoned back to London and tried and acquitted right. and acquitted. And that would, I would I just, I was thinking that that might have made an interesting bridging uh, example in, in your book. I mean, the, the, the English East India, I mean, read a fascinating book called the anarchy. That book discusses uh, the justice one, company that basically, you know, was government, like when they gave them monopoly over the trade routes and all of that, they had armies, they pillaged and they controlled and, uh, you know, India until the British government uh, took it away from them. Uh, so they were very much government like. Um, and so the, the, the limited liability part, obviously, it came came later, it enabled, you know, trading in stocks and things that you couldn't do. Otherwise, but you know, the English East India um, was was a joint stock, you know, company that that was that was accountable only to its, you know, its shareholders in 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 London uh, and to nobody else. Uh, as it went around, you know, uh, conquering India, impoverishing people, taxing people, uh, and being violent too. Yeah, well, and it's, I think, significant that Hastings is prosecuted because of corruption. Right. 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 He has misused his office, right. which he has because of the, the British government, not because of, say, the All opium the trade stuff he or did like, in yeah, murdering lots of people and so on. And, I mean, another a case that I do try to draw out is, is the Bank of England, which yep. is also a private corporation that's responsible to yep. shareholders until it's nationalized by a labor government in 1946. Um, and they're doing monetary policy. You know, and throughout the 19th century, 
in moments where the gold standard is at risk, they raise their interest rate to defend themselves and defend the gold standard. They know that the cost of that will be imposing unemployment and crisis on the domestic population. They also know that population largely can't vote. Uh, and so they do it. That was the kind of, that yeah. was the afterlife but, of 1825 that I had in mind. Yeah, um, central banks, yeah. Yeah, and so that in some ways, uh, I, I often wish that I had gone through 2008. Uh, it was hard to think of how to deal with the Great Depression. There's a lot that happens in the Great Depression. And I thought, well, that's that's, that's volume two. Um, we'll see how this one goes over first. Um, let's see. Um, on maybe a, a last and related point about that before I turn it over to our audience. Um, I really loved the sentence uh, that it isn't necessarily about crisis. The crisis is when we see something is wrong, but things can be wrong for a long time. And indeed, the book is kind of implotted around these different moments of financial crisis, exactly because crises really concentrate the mind right, and focus our attention uh, and, and work as moments where something has to change. Nothing. They also leave a pretty good archival record, which <laughs> is helpful. But the my hope is that the that's why there are these kind of interstitial chapters about the attempt to create historical memory around the meaning of the crises, how they worked out the way that they did, who was responsible, how we understand that, and how that feeds into the development of the history of economic thought, um, which itself is a body of thought that has very specific and perhaps unusual beliefs about responsibility, culpability, morality, normativity, and so on, that I think emerge in parallel with and in a relationship to the kind of material history of the financial crises themselves. Um, and so I think that there's a way that when I ask myself, when is the crisis over? Well, in some ways it's never over because we're always relitigating and rewriting the history of our understanding of the crisis. Um, and I think that's very much true of 2008 uh, today. Mm -hmm. So. I think I'll wrap up there. I think my publishers would probably be happy if I mentioned that the far cheaper paperback will be out in January. Uh, Some of us have research budgets. I'm not sure your, not your publishers one. would be happy. Yeah. For by $99 yeah. Dollars yeah. Well, is well, a bit much. I, it's under 20 I tried. <laughs> that was the one thing I tried to negotiate. I know. They, just, selling. Quit selling. Yeah. they just would not move. But cheap. Uh, I negotiated cheap. Great. Wonderful. Well, um, um, I uh, I won't abuse the moderator's privilege yet of asking my questions, but I have I have a lot of things I could push you on about the history as well. Maybe we can great. So especially if folks want to talk about the core history stuff, and we can certainly open out into current events as well. But there's so much to to deal with here. So great. And would you please introduce yourself briefly, so we all know each other? My name is Vicky Chang, and uh, so what I'm getting is that when the sovereign is corrupted by financial interests, then impunity happens for these corruptors. And it seems like the, the key right now to the destruction of democracy in America is Citizens United. The corporation has the power to secretly give money to anybody in the government, and they do. I mean, I, I think the- It's legal corruption. It's legal and it's completely, I don't know. I would really like to hear what your thoughts are on how we can get rid of this, because I, I think the number of uh, lobbyists in uh, Washington, D.C. went from like 50 in 1970 to like thousands now. And it's just Washington is just flooding with money. And, you know, like the Supreme Court is not immune either. They, they take these secret trips. They 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 benefit. So when the sovereign is corrupted, then the government is not interested in doing the right thing. I think, I mean, sovereignty is an important conceptual component to the book. And part of what I wanted to argue is that I think there's a, a kind of broad acceptance that impunity is a characteristic that often adheres to sovereigns. Right? There, there is such a thing as sovereign immunity. Um, and that was even part of what I wanted to get at, is that as we have emerged into a more constrained democratic vision of politics, that there are still spaces in which this older form of sovereign immunity or impunity continue to exist. But, you know, that still I want to emphasize is where I wanted to get to at the end was a kind of idea that the real impunity isn't 
breaking the rules and getting away with them. The real impunity is setting the rules. Right. Right? And in that sense, I don't think that there is, that it isn't necessarily a question of the corruption of sovereignty so much as it's a constitutive feature of sovereignty, that that is where law comes from, is through some unequal distribution of violence and legitimacy. And that that is something that we can think about being differently distributed and changing over time. Um, could, could I in, ask please. interject a question on this point here, maybe? So, so, so this sort of interested me because the the framing of impunity that you borrow from sort of international law is just it's just one way that law tries to get at the question of who is subject to liability for what acts by whom. Right. And so starting with impunity and international rights, that, that's a pretty high level, kind of pretty far away. Not Whereas something just like ordinary tort liability mm. would be much more the heart of it. And sometimes when you spoke about the, the harm that's done by financial crisis, it reminds me of problems of complex causation in tort law, right, where sometimes there's not an obvious remedy when you have something that's like a structural condition to which everyone contributes a very small part and there's some process of magnification mm -hmm. and there's some really disproportionate harms. Sometimes we try and hold people liable at the front stage. Sometimes we don't. Mm -hmm. And and how sovereignty fits in is the question about whether sovereignty is corrupt. There, it could be that, and then the, the too big to fail claim mm -hmm. at the heart, I think is the claim that there are some kinds of systemically uh, relevant activities that you can you can't dispense with them, and you can't regulate them in a one to one level. Mm. And in those cases, the standard argument has been the government has to do those things. It's too big to fail means you can't leave it to the private sector, but it's not like you can dispense with the activity anyway. Mm. So I wanted to hear about a different question. That might be a way in which so one view on the corruption would not be that citizens united. The corruption might be a financial system is a necessary part of a modern polity, it is in, it is inherently subject to all of these feedback mechanisms that make it very unstable. Hold on, now, I'm, I'm just, now I get to ask my question. Um, it's subject to all these loops um, and the ordinary ways in which we hold people liable in the person to person dealings that private law is most accustomed to don't really scale. So the corruption might be that we don't think of this activity as sovereign at all. But if it is sovereign, then maybe sovereign immunity should apply to the banking system if we're a public system. So, right. I mean, if it's publicly owned. exactly. So, yeah. so, 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 with that as long preface, the question would be: There's one direction of the book that that focuses on the thought that these crises show a problem with not holding people to account. That's the opinion. But a different angle you could take would be to say the problem is that we're allowing certain private actors to control something that is properly regime level. And if it's regime level, as you say, it's almost a deduction of sovereign of, of, of legal theory that acts of the sovereign can't be subject to ordinary law because the sovereign makes the law. And so those are two very different outcomes. One would push to something like public the banking sector understood as a public utility that's in effect been privatized improperly. The other would point to something like we need to hold private actors who stay private to account when they engage in systemically relevant harmful activity. And, th and there's very different valences. One would assume that we can sort of, and I wonder, and, and the book ending in 1825 doesn't deal with progressive era legislation on public utility doctrine, fiat currency, and the banking crisis. Um, but I think the, 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 the response we often have to financial crises tends to be poised between these two things. We, we want to hold the bad guys responsible. But we sort of know that we can't because there's a system that they're a part of that is bigger than them. So what's your intuition on that, if, that, if that's at all helpful? That is a very helpful set of questions. Um, so I thought a lot about the tort crime boundary. Right. And, you know, it's a historian's book. It's not trying to be a prescriptivist policy book about how we should Right. define what's on which side of the tort crime boundary. Rather, it's to say that that isn't a natural, permanent, inevitable distinction, but is something that comes out of a series of crises and contested political moments and could very easily have gone in different directions. Right? And so if we think to ourselves, well, that's actually an unstable political thing rather than like a feature of whatever natural law, that does open up the possibility that it could go in a different direction. But I feel like I had to establish that 
you know, historicizing the distinction first. And I think the way that I would square the two prongs that you speak to is exactly the point about democracy, right? that we might think that there are some set of, as you say, regime level powers. The one that I focus on in the bank is central, or in the book is central banking. Central bank. That was Freud, uh, is central banking, which begins, right, as a private set of activities. And eventually we recognize perhaps this should be something controlled by the state. Um, but that returns us to a debate that we have today, which is about democratic accountability of central banks. Should they be insulated? Should they not? Should they be responsive to voters? Should they not? And that, you know, when I allude to this kind of large scale separation at the end of the book that I tried to get to, I mean, the, the big implication that I want the reader to come away with is that under capitalism, we distribute wages and profits as like the means of staying alive and continuing to eat through a market mechanism. Maybe that's the large scale thing that should be subject to democratic accountability. Right. And is a, actually a regime level way of organizing society, uh, but is something that through the course of the 18th and into the 19th century got hived off from the sphere of democracy and moral economy. I, I, I interrupt you. I, you I have something to say because you talked about too big to fail and being systemic. The fact of the matter is okay, we had one case study to basically fall straight into our hands as we were trying to finish the book, which is, uh, you may you may have not followed this, but Credit Suisse in Switzerland. So that bank, uh, an old institution, uh, very large, and I have encountered the Swiss, uh, you know, bank CEOs and regulators telling me, no problem, no problem, we got some magic buttons, we're gonna press them, and voila, we're gonna have bail-in instead of bail-outs, and whoops. They didn't do it, okay? They didn't do it because actually it doesn't work and it can't work. And so we have to question whether we need institutions that are global uh, across the border. We can ask whether it's worth it to create these too big to fail institutions. The word systemic, which is where we get to be hostages, all of us, because you know the options are so bad either way, um, again, is preventable. Right now, the word systemic is just a code word for bailouts because they have to use that word in order to provide bailouts. Uh, and so all of a sudden, SVB is systemic and, you know, signature is systemic and, uh, and, let's, uh, and let's save them because some, somebody will be harmed. And we don't, we don't like that. So we like to appease everybody at the moment. So they, you know, they just blink every single time in banking. So that's all preventable uh, if they had the guts to, to actually counter the bad incentives. And that's, you know, we advocate very sensible regulations that they just can't seem to, to develop political will to do because of uh, enormous uh, amount of lobbying. So, you know, we are bringing them closer to the world of, of unlimited liability, just a little bit more liability, basic liability for losses. I, I just wanted to pick up on something that really you said that where I, I was just thinking, we have a nice little historical experiment in America called the um, the uh, the bank crisis between Biddle and Jackson. Right. The bank war. The bank war. Mm -hmm. The um, U.S. Second Bank of the United States, uh, chartered by Congress, is uh, up for renewal and Jackson vetoes it. And the U.S. doesn't have a central bank. And in fact, it does have an incredibly fragile banking system that is not subject to any underwriting. And But then we have to fight a major war, which the government needs to raise an enormous amount of money for. So it sort of improvises until finally, finally, we wind up with the Fed after 80, 90 years of experimentation without a central bank. So it's an interesting extension of the discussion that you were just having. Oh, great. Uh, I realize we, we only got about 10 minutes yeah. left. I wonder, could we take two or three questions and comments and then, and then give yeah. Trevor there the last go. word? That might be the best yeah. way. Yeah. yeah. Um, hi, I'm Nadir Atasi. Um, I wanted to ask about the, emer the your argument with the emergence of the economy as a separate sphere. Um, scholars, I feel like scholars love to argue, uh, I mean, economic, uh, sorry, historians of economic thought love to argue about who was the first to kind of come up with the economy conceptually, like was it Smith, was it the physiocrats? Tim Mitchell says, no, it wasn't until Keynes actually. Um, 
So I, I mean, I find your argument about, um, you know, why don't we trace this socially and spatially very interesting. But I was wondering, uh, because the period you talk about is such a generative period for political economy, um, how do you view the relationship between that history and the conceptual history uh, and emer conceptual emergence of the economy? Thanks. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I haven't had a chance to read the book yet. And I'm looking forward to getting the paper back. Um, and um, I wanted to ask about, um, I guess, uh, from a legal perspective, what um, laws or what specific rules um, uh, were, I mean, were the same law, sim same or similar laws in place during both of these periods, the period of uh, liability and the period of impunity? that you trace? And if so, did you see anything that helps us understand um, kind of like what unwritten rules are being mobilized to decide when we want to actually enforce the laws on the books uh, and when we don't? And actually, um, it makes me think about another Supreme Court case from this week, which is the case about the SEC's internal administrative law judges. And one of the arguments for impunity or, or, or for going to the Article Three court system and avoiding the SEC court system um, is um, that, oh, uh, yes, it's OK to go to an administrative law judge, non-Article Three judge, if um, the law being there's a Supreme Court case that says if the, the law being enforced is one that wasn't really on the books at the time of the Seventh Amendment. And, uh, 1791 or whatever. And then the argument they're making is actually this is very similar to common law fraud that was considered a, a, um, a, a crime and a civil tort type thing back then. And uh, so it makes me think of that. And um, so I'm just trying to think about, you know, uh, work. I mean, it seems to me that as a lawyer, you could find stuff to convict people with across all of these crises. So then it, I think that, you know, I'm trying to get a handle on what you were seeing in your documents about um, how those decisions were being made. Thank you very much. So interesting, uh, extremely interesting, the, the the discussion, I think also the book. I have a question. It's more your opinion. I would like to have your opinion about how you explain the fact that in our time, uh, let's say popular masses, people, citizens, um, let's say there are, there, there is a kind of social apathy towards impunity. How you explain that? Uh, maybe uh, the, the, the aggressive lobbying, let's say that we observe plays a role on that uh, the fact that we have a kind of high high level expertise legal expertise that let's say it's a kind of immunity for for big uh, corporate actors so they have all the tools to convince people that actually there is nothing to discuss about so because this is the, the, the real problem of democracy why people they don't react on all these things they know that there, there is a problem but Yeah, you could try to answer the question <laughs> from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, passing the mic is is definitely the trickiest part. Um, I uh, I guess playing the historian, um, yeah. I wanted to go back to what might be some contributing factors to this emerging notion of impunity, and I'm particularly interested in the late 18th, early 19th century love to hear how they link up with some of your side interests. Um, in the first instance, uh, <clears throat> catastrophe and extinction. Um, when you're ending this book uh, with this model of new or emergent impunity, it's also happening at a, at a time where you have changing ideas about natural disaster itself. Um, and particularly uh, in France and Britain, you see sort of this dialectic between catastrophism and sedimentarism. I, without trying to lead you down my rabbit hole, <laughs> I'd love to hear about what you think new ideas of catastrophe do to the possibility of human agency um, and accountability. And I also think we should be clear that impunity doesn't, in this case, mean there's no punishment, no pain. It's being dispersed. It's being displaced. And I'd be curious about what you think about then who has to bear the brunt um, and what that says about new ideas of human nature. Um, really quickly, decolonization. Uh, we're, we're, There's no way that's going to be quick. <laughs> there, and, and it's question mark, no. But okay. what I would say is, um, this goes to the, the conversation about sovereignty. Um, you know, here we're riding out the first great wave of global decolonization, American and Haitian revolutions, Latin American revolutions, the emergence of, of a dozen sovereign uh, nation states into the world order. Um, to what extent then is 
impunity in investment, uh, in, in, in speculation. Uh, to what extent is that a, sort of a continuation of negotiations about sovereignty? Uh, you know, who's, who's in charge here? Uh, fundamentally, who controls this, this global, not just financial order, but moral order? Great. With five minutes, you have yeah, that'll be that'll be you have your test. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. Um, those are great questions, and I actually am going to try to get to all of them. Okay. Um, so, on the emergence of the economy, I mean, I'm an early modernist. I'm very skeptical of the Timothy Mitchell yeah. uh, 20th century story. I am much more willing to think that this comes out of early modern jurisprudence, um, both spatially and thematically, in the sense of like the law of the seas. Um, thinking about, there, Sophus Reinhardt has a terrific article about the difference between imperium and dominium and how dominium as a space of like uh, property law emerges as a separate kind of sphere of law and sovereignty from uh, control over territory. I would put this in the 17th century, but I put nearly everything in the 17th century. So yeah, <laughs> correct. take that for what you will. Um, and, and in part, that's because when I look at the documents and I see people writing about, say, the circulation of the trade, in my mind, metaphorically, that's not too far off from thinking about the economy. Now, maybe these are different discursive worlds and different discursive spaces meaning different things, but that still might be analogous and still in, in the lineage rather than a completely separate thing. Um, so do I see similar laws before and after? Well, the thing is that there isn't really a before and an after. Instead, you know... My wife hates this metaphor, but I think it's a good one. It's like trying to squeeze a water balloon, you know, where like if you squeeze part of it, it squirts out somewhere and you squeeze that and it squirts out somewhere else. You know, that there's never there's never a before and an after. Rather, where impunity is and how it works changes and moves and maybe sediments and maybe, you know, erodes and is constantly subject to political contestation. Um, now, it's true that very often when I talk to lawyers about the subject, they say impunity, you mean prosecutorial discretion. Uh, which is there in the book a bit, because I noticed how often that came up. Uh, and indeed, in the crisis moments that I talk about, there are moments of prosecutorial discretion, right? Who are we going to prosecute and for what? Mm -hmm. But what I felt like was a more interesting story is that the crises in the book are also moments of shifts in the constitutional order itself. Mm -hmm. um, so the South Sea directors are prosecuted by a secret committee of the House of Commons that itself had authorized the scheme and creates four laws after the fact to retroactively prosecute the directors on. Now, okay, that's prosecution, but it's not quite right what we have in mind. The French Revolution is enough of a complicated case, I think you'll agree, that I'm not going to try to get through it in my remaining three minutes, but is definitely a space in which what we mean by prosecutorial distinction or discretion is a shifting and very eminently political space. But importantly, by the time I get to 1825, the questions move. There's no prosecution for anything because no crime has happened. And so that's right the change over time that I'm trying to get to. On social apathy, I'm actually slightly skeptical. And here I'm going to get more presentist than I've intended to be so far, which is that some reviewers have thought that I wrote this book because I was angry about 2008. And that's true. But, <laughs> <laughs> good, for uh, good for you. But I'm also angry at George Bush uh, and the Iraq War. And which seems to me to have shockingly have been largely memory hold um, to uh, you know, a way that I find as a historian very upsetting. Um, and I have a kind of instinctive sense that's very hard at a scholarly level to prove that the fact that there were no, that nobody was held accountable for the large scale criminality and mass crimes of the Bush years has created a kind of what I've elsewhere described inelegantly excuse me, as a purge-shaped hole in the political imaginary, I think has gotten us to the point where the main thing that many political parties across the world are doing is promising that their supporters, that they will jail the opponents that they're against, right? Up to and including Donald Trump is up for, you know, four different felony prosecutions in four different places. Now, I'm not doubting that he did all those things. I think he probably also did a lot of other things, up to and including things that many American presidents do, uh, that we've long stopped thinking about as in any way criminal. Um, but it seems significant to me that in the 2022 elections, uh, I think I counted 11 different people running, promising that they would jail their opponents. Right. Trump is saying the same things. We've seen that uh, 
I mean, we've seen that very literally in Brazil. We've seen that in a lot of different places. And my sense is that in absence of the legitimate procedures of justice, there is a sense that some terrible injustice has happened and someone has to be held accountable. We just don't know who or how to do it. Um, on decolonization, catastrophe, and accountability. <laughs> um, one minute. In one minute. I thought colonial spaces would be more of spaces for impunity than in fact they turned out to be. In fact, the impunity that I felt like I saw there is very similar to sovereign impunity writ large. Uh, and so we have cases like Hastings, where he's prosecuted, but for violating the laws of the metropole, right. not for the things that he does in the, the colonial space. Instead, when there are these weird moments of uncertain sovereignty, that seems to be a fruitful place for impunity to proliferate. And so exactly in a decolonial moment, when sovereignty is unclear, that means all sorts of possibilities are up for grabs. And so the example that I use yeah. is the case of Gregor McGregor uh, and the country that he invented, yeah. all right, which is in fact one of many countries that were invented, uh, but he manages to secure a sovereign loan. Um, now, the interesting thing about that is in 1822, when he gets a, a sovereign loan in London for a country that doesn't exist, it's hard to say that Greece existed. They also get a loan. It's just that they survive because the sovereignty turns out to be durable in a way that Gregor McGregor's was not. Um, and so I, I almost think that like the causality runs the other way. Um, Byron, and Byron didn't die for Gregor McGregor. Right. <laughs> no. Um, no, although three boatloads of colonists departed yeah. thinking yeah. that they were going to get land and had right. to be rescued from Belize, um, you know, as you do. Uh, but as a last point on catastrophe, a fine place to end. Um, strikingly, I think, once uh, uh, ideas of extinction events uh, are first mooted, which happens after 1796, there's a guy called Georges Cuvier, who's a kind of sinister uh, figure in France who, you know, sinister in the sense that he's one of the foundational figures of like pseudoscientific racism, um, but also conceptualizes catastrophic extinction events. Um, one of his main sets of opponents are economists who essentially argue that nothing can ever permanently go away. It will just sort of get more and more expensive over time. And so they're like unwilling to think uh, in terms of total finitude. And that's the thing that I find particularly from as a historian, particularly interesting is the possibility of thinking seriously about finitude and whether finitude gives meaning to historical periodization and whether it also gives meaning because of the scarcity implication to not just our time, but to material resources, that if things are infinite, then their value is in some ways either non-existent or immeasurable. And if that's true of things, it's also true of time. And so maybe the emergence of catastrophe is also an emergence of thinking seriously about finitude. And that poses a set of challenges to the newly emerging economic order that then are suppressed. And we have a long 19th century in which we don't really think seriously about finitude. I urge you all to go home and think well, that's, seriously yeah, about that, finitude. That seems a timely <laughs> note to end our time on. So uh, please join me in thanking Trevor and the commentators. <laughs>